to be with y'all here. I hope that you don't take for granted the weather that you have. <laughs> Enjoy it. Don't complain about the rain. It's like 70 degrees here. So um, I live in Minnesota. Uh, so um, my son was going to come. Um, he was hoping to come. He's a freshman in college, but he also plays basketball and his team did well. And so that didn't happen because they had to stay in. It's March, you know, so that kind of deal. So uh, but I'd love to bring him and meet y'all sometime. Um, he's, did I say he's a freshman? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So he's just getting used to the college thing. So, all right. So let's jump into Acts chapter 10. Now, yeah. Quick question. Did you or did you not meet Kevin Durant? <laughs> um, I have preached to Kevin Durant a couple times. Great. Um, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing when you're preaching and someone walks in the back and you're like, that's Kevin Durant. Okay. Um, it, it was nice. A friend of ours introduced us and I, he said, this is Michael. And he turned around and he goes, hi, I'm Kevin. And I was thinking, like, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, amen. But, uh, um, any other questions? Okay. Uh, Acts, Acts chapter 10. So here's the thing with Acts. And one of the themes of the book of Acts is really reconciliation. Bringing in different types of people into the family of God together as one. And you see that, for instance, in Acts chapter 8. Of course, they're bringing in Samaritans, which Jewish people didn't really like, and so they had to figure out how to reconcile with them. And then there's a picture in Acts chapter 9 of uh, reconciliation really between people of unequal power groups, right? Because you have Saul, who is, I'll just do a little review of Acts chapter 9. You guys did it last week, was it? Or? No, we haven't done Acts 9 yet. We skipped a couple. We skipped a couple. They go to Acts 10. Okay, interesting. Yeah. All right. <laughs> We're doing more of a postmodern approach. Right, yeah, exactly. uh, we can't so be bound teams. together by specific right. hierarchy of numbers. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, so in Acts chapter nine, there's a reconciliation that's really about a power imbalance. You have Saul who is hunting down Christians, and he's on his way to Damascus, and Jesus appears to him in a vision, and there's a light show, and he goes blind, and he goes on to Damascus, and the text tells us that. He's in Damascus praying, and he's at a house on Straight Street. Um, and you're supposed to pick up, if you're living in the first century, that if you're in a house with a street that has a name, that's a rich person, right? Because most people live on streets that don't have names. And on the other hand, we have Ananias, who's in this small group of uh, Christians that are being hunted down by Saul. They don't have social power. Saul has social power. Saul has political power, he has religious power, uh, Ananias doesn't have any of those things. And so both men get a vision that they're going to meet with one another and be reconciled, and Saul's going to be brought into the family of God. The chief persecutor of the Christians, Jesus is bringing them in. And Saul seems to have no problem with it. He's like, sounds good, right? And Ananias, who's on the lower end of the power structure, is like, whoa, oh, oh, oh. hold up. Do you know who this guy is and where you're asking me to go and what you're asking me to do here, right? Because, and I think one of the messages there is when you're reconciling, people that have privilege and power don't tend to see that gap, Yeah. right? They're kind of blind to it. So Saul's like, yeah, cool, all right, send him. And Ananias is like, he's got some bitterness and some fear mm. and some hurt to get over. But I think one of the messages there is that 
Uh, and it's really interesting because Jesus could have just come back to Saul and said, you, you know, I'm the Messiah now. I appear to you. You're going to go preach me. But instead, he sends this low power guy. And I think the message is you of privilege and power are going to need these lower status people to really see, mm. to cure your blindness. If you really want to see what's going on in the world, you're going to need their perspective. Right. So he sends him to him. And of course, Ananias has to get over the fear and the bitterness and the hurt that had been caused by that. And so there's a reconciliation. In chapter 10, we get a little bit of a different reconciliation, but one that is continuing to go on. Now we have an equal. We don't have somebody who's lower status. We have this guy named Cornelius, who is of high status. He's, he's a big deal, although he's of a group that was not reconciled with the Jewish people. He's a Gentile. He's a respected, powerful Gentile, but he's still a Gentile nonetheless. And so before we jump into that text, I think one of the interesting questions to ask is, what is the big deal here? Why is Acts so concerned with reconciliation? Why is it so concerned with racial reconciliation, ethnic reconciliation, cultural uh, reconciliation? Isn't that a modern idea? And that's just something that got made up in the last few years in liberal circles, right? You know, reconciliation. Um, well, no, this is a biblical idea. And so it's a key theme in Acts because it's a key theme in the Bible. In fact, if we go back to Genesis 1, it says all human beings were made, were created in what? The image of God, right? Both who? Male, Male and female. That summarizes pretty much everybody, right? As general categories, that includes all human beings were made in the image of God, as equals. That's the way God intended creation to be. In Genesis 3, the serpent comes. Now, the serpent is kind of a member of the divine council. We're not going to get into all that, but he's a spiritual being, and he comes in very snake-like fashion and says, you were made for more than being an image bearer. You're better than that. You're greater than that. You can be like a god. You're superior to being an image bearer. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? It's good sounding arguments often do. But what's the downside of that? Anybody want to guess? Yeah. What's the downside to thinking you're superior? It does undermine God, yeah. Okay, it creates chaos. Imbalance. There's something far more simple. You guys are too smart. Sin. Huh? Sin. What is sin? You're not. Well, you're not. Yeah, that's true. But if you create in your mind that you're superior, what does that by default do? There you go. As soon as I create the category of superior, I have now created the category of inferior, right? And so if I'm superior, then others are going to be inferior. And that's the tale of human history. The serpent has been weaving that same lie over and over and over again in different versions. We're superior because of the ethnic group we're a part of, we're superior because of the nation that we're a part of, we're superior because of the knowledge we have, we're superior because of the status we hold, we're superior because of the economic power we have. And, they, and you go on with different versions. You get later in history, we're superior because of the color of our skin. Right? And we divide. See, human history, the message of the Bible and this becomes important in the New Testament and in Acts. There's bigger things going on than just individual personal sin. Yeah. That's not good, but there's bigger things at play. And the term that the Bible often uses for that is the powers and principalities. 
right? It's these spiritual forces, these spiritual beings. We get it, we get hints of them, tantalizing, but it, it never describes it too much. There's a little bit in Daniel. There's a little bit in the Psalms. There's a little bit here and there. Paul seems rather content in just referring to them without really telling us how they got there and who they are and what's going on. He more wants to talk about their impact. And so think of it like this. Think of, you, you guys ever heard the term mob mentality? Yeah. You ever seen that in action? Right? Could you define mob mentality? What starts it? How does it carry out? How does it pass from one person to the next? What, what, you know, what causes it, what, what it's gonna do? We can't really define it, but you know it when you see it. Right? right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's, it seems to become a force in and of itself, isn't it? Suddenly a rational group of people start doing irrational things oftentimes with that mob mentality. That makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. In a similar way, the powers and principalities and dark forces, do we not see things that start happening in the world that don't seem to make sense? Yeah. Cultures or countries take on almost kind of a, a, a spirit about them, a form. The, the ancient Romans would have called it a genius. They use the term differently than we do. We mean smart. They meant the spirit of a group or an individual. And so there's these powers and principalities that, that are there. And the way they work is they, they set up things and they set cultures and they set countries in a direction. And it sort of twists what, what happens. It takes something good and twists it, right? Yeah. You can easily take something that's good and twist it, can you not? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Think of the freedom of speech. Is that a good thing? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a good thing. Can that be twisted for evil? Yeah. 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 Absolutely, right? You can take almost anything and start to twist it. And so the Bible says watch out for these principalities and powers. We're not going to be fighting them like demon hunters, but we're going to, we've got to be aware of and fight the effects that they have in society. And their main thing is to divide us to sow division, to go into a group of people made as image bearers and convince us that we're pitted against one another. Instead of that we're all equal, working together in unity and love. That's what God wants to bring us into. That's reconciliation. But we've been divided. And we are convinced that we're different. Different than you because of this, because of that. I'm superior, you're inferior, you're inferior, I'm superior, whatever it is. And so there's this war going on. Does that make sense so yeah, far? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now in the book of Ephesians, we are getting the Acts, I promise. In the book of Ephesians, though, Paul talks all about this. He says in chapter 1, verse 15, I'm just going to kind of describe it. You can go back and read it later if you want. But he says... We are all being brought into Christ. And then he praises the church in Ephesus because of their love for all of God's people. That's not just a generic term. He says you're doing the work of God, which is to bring humanity back together as image bearers, fighting against the division of the cosmic powers. And in ch chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, he says Christ has won a victory over the cosmic powers. That's an amazing thing. He's defeated them at the cross, which seemed like a loss, seemed like a huge L, but he's won the victory. Right. And then he says something really incredible in chapter 2, the first three verses. He says, and he's not just talking to individuals. He's talking about people groups, humans, in the contrast to these powers and principalities. He says, human culture is enslaved. They've twisted every part of human culture so that you cannot escape the powers and principalities. Because if you try to use human wisdom or political logic or philosophy or ideology, you will find yourself simply going around in a maze and trapped by them because they've twisted everything back in on itself. That makes sense? Yeah. We cannot escape the powers and principalities. 
we come up with a good idea that seems like it'll help over here, but it harms something over here, right? right? We can't escape. And he says, but that's where the victory of Christ comes in. See, he frees you. He's brought us back together. He's reconciling, bringing the world in as image bearers. And then in chapter 2, he goes on and he says, that's why there has to be diversity. That's why Jew and Gentile were bringing down the walls of division, whether it be political or racial or ethnic. He says, the church is the sign that God has defeated the powers and principalities. Amen. Amen. He's given them the death blow. Now, they're still dangerous, but they're mortally wounded. And the sign, because that's a big claim. You know, we could all say, well, I beat the powers and principalities, right? I could say, you know, uh, the Bucks have won the NBA championship <laughs> for the second year in a row. Nope. Well, and somebody would say, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm going to need some evidence for that, right? <laughs> what the NBA you watched? And, well, I'll have the evidence in June. Uh -huh. However, uh -huh. Uh -huh. right? And immediately, y'all are like, nope, need the evidence for that. So Paul says, Jesus has defeated the powers and principalities. Okay, where's your evidence? And Paul says, it's right here. It's Ooh. you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the cool. diverse church. Yeah. That's why the church has to be diverse. It is image bearers being brought back together as one without divisions. The powers and principalities divide. Where there is no division, they have been defeated. That's evidence of it. Right? And he says in chapter 3 of Ephesians, it's the manifold wisdom of God on display to the powers and principalities. Showing what God could do. See, we skip by all that power and principality language, right? We tend to just go, oh, that's weird. I don't know what that's about. We just sort of throw it out. So this is what's happened. We are the visible victory of God. We are the display of God's wisdom to the world. That's why this reconciliation is so important. Amen. So in Acts chapter 10, and again, uh, if, if you have your app or your Bible open or whatever to Acts 10, I'm not going to read the whole passage. We're just going to kind of go through it. You can follow through and see what's happening here. But in, uh, I'll read the first few verses. It says at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need, and he prayed to God regularly. So he's a good dude. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw the angel of God who came in and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants, he told them everything that had happened to them and sent them to Joppa. So here we have the start of this reconciliation. Their division, I'm going to send a dude named Peter. Cornelius seems pretty open to it. Sounds good. Then we get in the next section. And we're told that Peter has a vision. And can you think of a word, if you know this passage, What's one word that would describe Peter's attitude towards people of other groups? That is superior. <laughs> superior, what did you say? Hostile. Sorry. Hostile. Hostile. Okay. Hostile. 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 Reluctant. Reluctant. Peter's a big yeah. <laughs> to use modern language, Peter's racist. Yeah. Now this is the guy who walked with Jesus and heard him say, go make disciples of all nations. But man, we can explain things away, can't we? And I think in the minds of a lot of people, they were like, 
we're going to make disciples of all nations of Jews who have been scattered right. to the nations exactly. around. Exactly. Right? <laughs> we'll stick to our own people. Peter's not getting this. So the Spirit sends him a vision. That is not human spirit. That's not the gathering of the nations. Here's what we're going to do. So he gives him this vision of basically him eating unclean, unkosher foods and says, everything's clean. And Peter's like, no, he's not kind of getting the point. He's like, I've never eaten unclean food and I won't. And the angel's like, okay, this is not really about food. <laughs> Good night. This is about people. Don't call people unclean. And so that's the message. He still saw other groups as unclean. He's been following Jesus for years and is still blind to the great lie. Yep, yep. He still believes that some people are superior. We can like the idea of diversity, but not want to deal with the obstacles. Mm. Right? It's bigger than just saying, let's all kumbaya and hold hands and be together. We're going to be one big group. There are obstacles to overcome with that, aren't there? Yeah. There's sins. There's, there's things of the past. There's prejudices. There's things that we have to be open with and deal with. And so he's calling Peter out on this. Now, it's interesting. After that happens in verse 24, so Peter kind of gets the message. And this next, this next passage, I want you to imagine if this is, you were really there, right? Because this is cringy, you know? I mean, it's like, oh my goodness. You, you ever been around like some old people who say things and it's like, that's not, not okay to say that. <laughs> right? Okay. I mean, I just, can I be real? I don't want to be offensive, but I'll give you a real example. <laughs> I was with an older relative of mine one time and we were watching a documentary about black basketball players and he goes, those guys are really well spoken for black guys. And my sons looked at me and they were like, oh. and I'm like, you can't say that anymore. And he's like, what is a compliment? And I'm like, no, it's not. So it says in verse 24, the following day he arrived in Caesarea, Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up, stand up, he said, I'm only a man myself. Good start. While talking with them, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. So now here you have this Jewish dude with all these Gentiles. And he says, you're well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate or visit with a Gentile. Yes. Can you imagine that? <laughs> that, I mean, for real, think about that. Yeah, right? Okay. I mean, this would literally be like someone walking in, say I walked into this room and said, you're well aware, by the way, that my parents are huge racists, right? <laughs> But, and go on and on, and you'll all be like, what is <laughs> So you're, you're, well, you're well aware that it's against our law for us to associate with you. <laughs> but you got to love Peter, because he just says stuff. <laughs> He's honest. My kind of guy. He's honest. You don't wonder what Peter's thinking. Who among you would have the nerve to stand up to Jesus and say, you got it wrong, Jesus. You shouldn't be telling people you're going to go to the cross. Stop that. <laughs> he did it. So he says to them, you're well aware, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. <laughs> You're kind of like, it's just great for you, Peter. Where's this all going right now? This is getting really awkward and weird. So when I was sent for, I came without raising objection. May I ask why you sent for me? So 
Peter had prejudice that God dealt with and had to show him. There's going to be challenges when we come together. And it's not always just going to be the person in the position of power. When we come together, there will be issues raised up in bringing diverse groups together. We've got to recognize that. Those things are going to come up. And Peter, although it's, you know, there's a little bit of a lack of tact there, he's honest about it. He just gets it out there. You know this is what we think, right? But God showed me differently. So he's willing to acknowledge his bias. There's honest dialogue, and he owned his failings. And I'm sure it was a little more humble than it comes across to us. It's a different culture, a different way of communicating, because they don't seem too offended by it. The next point is there's a God-centered vision. Notice in verse 30, Cornelius answered three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and he said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send a Joppa for Simon, who's called Peter. He's in the guest of the home of Simon the Tanner who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately and it was good of you to come. Now we're all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. He's willing to drop the divisions, the bias, the hurts, the cringy language from Peter, <laughs> and say, let's just get God's vision of who we're supposed to be here. Tell us what God wants us to do, and we'll follow that. Amen. So there's a, a God vision. They're willing to let God define their identities and their interactions. Both are, that's hard work, isn't it? Yeah. It's easy to say, let's come together. It's harder to say, I'm going to let God redefine my identity and your identity. Because the powers and principalities want nothing more than for you to cling to that. Because our identities are not bad in and of themselves, right? It's not bad to be of different countries. It's not bad to be of different uh, ethnic groups. It's not bad to have different skin colors. But the powers and principalities can twist them right. into forms of division. Right. Are we willing to let God redefine that? Mm -hmm. Not ignore it. Not act like those things don't exist. See, it's part of God's victory to say, look around at all the different kinds of people. Right. So I'm not talking that colorblind guard. <laughs> Should I have said that? No. Yes. Um, yes. 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 We celebrate being different, but we've got to do the work also of redefining our identity. Right. According to being image bearers. In verse 34, Peter began to speak and he said, I now realize how true it is that God doesn't show favoritism, but he accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Peter's getting it. Right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Peter knew that Jesus had sent them to all the nations. Peter knew that. But the base truth is not always enough. He had to learn more. He had to go deeper. It took him time to grasp it. His biases and assumptions got in the way of him fully seeing the truth. We tend to, these days, we want to write somebody off it. You don't get it all immediately, you're out. Imagine if that had happened here. And yet, God was willing to be patient and work with Peter. Amen. And work with Cornelius. And bring them. And, and we find out later that Peter still had more to learn, didn't he? <laughs> Galatians 2, anyone? Well, yeah. After this happened. 
A few years later, he's in Antioch eating with a bunch of different people, and then Jews from Judea show up, and Peter's like, yeah, okay, I can't eat with you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's still wrestling with this. Stuff. Right. It's going to be a challenge to come together with full reconciliation. It won't be easy. There'll be a lot of reasons to say, give this up. It's easier to just be with your own kind. That's the powers and principalities. That's them gaining victory. <coughs> when we divide and go back to just those who are like us, the powers and principalities win. In verse 39, it says, we are witnesses of everything you did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him. After he rose from the dead, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as the judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Amen. And what he's saying here, I want you to follow this. It's not just that, hey, Jesus died on the cross to pay your penalty. So that time you lied and those times that you lusted and those times that you weren't very kind to people, those are all wiped off, problem solved in the world. Now that's part of it, but what he's saying here is it's a bigger deal. Through his death, the powers and principalities were defeated. Amen. The thing that you could not escape. We can't escape division in the world. Look at it. Every time we think we're good. Remember 2015 when we thought the world was going in a good direction? <laughs> and everything was getting better? Remember that? We were so cute back then, weren't we? And now look at today. I mean, let's be real. Who's, what's going to happen next? I don't know. It's crazy, the division. That's what the powers and principalities do. We can't escape it. That's why the church has to be unified. Amen. That's why the church has to be diverse. He's ushered in a new age, and we are the first fruits of that age. We're supposed to show the world this is what it can look like if you trust God's wisdom. And through the Spirit, he says, while Peter is still speaking, these words were almost done here. The Holy Spirit came and all who heard the message. The circumcised believers had come with Peter who were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in other languages and praising God. And then Peter said, hey, now surely no one can stand in the way of being baptized with water. They received the Holy Spirit just like we did. It's referring back to Acts 2. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Or, uh, then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. That's a weird ending to the story, isn't it? <laughs> hey, we're not supposed to be prejudiced towards one another anymore. And the Spirit showed up and then they got baptized. Now that doesn't sound too weird to us because we've been Christianized enough. But in the original context, What's going on there? I'll simply sum it up with this. Throughout the Bible, there's a connection of spirit and water. Spirit and water. It's what God does when he forms people. When he forms his representatives, his image bearers. Genesis chapter 1. Who's hovering above the waters? Spirit. Oh, spirit. Okay. Um, move forward into Exodus. Who's, as, as the children of Israel... Uh, move their way out of Egypt. They're being led by the pillars and all that, but it's the spirit, right? Yeah. And how do they escape Egypt and become God's people? They go through Red sea, the Red Sea, the water, right? There's this con in Genesis 6. Water, spirit, saved through it, connection, the flood, right? You have it again with the Jordan River. You have Ezekiel, the prophets of the spirit and water. All I can say is when God forms his people, the spirit leads them to the water. Right. So 
what we have here is a group of people that many people would have been prejudiced against and said they can't be part of God's people because they're not ethnically part of us. So the spirit hovers over them in a sense. Well, now we can't deny it. The spirit made it obvious. We got to let them go through the water. They're part of us now. That's now our family. They've been redefined. They've been brought back as image bearers. God, I don't want to go there. Okay. Let's try to think how much time I had. There's a whole nother, there's a whole nother chain there, but we'll just have to leave it at that. But listen, let, let me end with this. The powers and principalities are known. If you want to see how powerful they are, look at how divided the world is. There's your evidence. Yeah. Wisdom cannot be. Political ideology cannot be. Self-discipline, cleverness. Like, let's just all come together and hold hands. That's not going to work. Only Christ defeated powers because he did it in a way that the world would never try. He lost. He lost. He laid his life down. And Paul actually says in 1 Corinthians 2, the, the powers can't figure it out. They're like, wait a minute, we just beat him. How did we lose? It'd be like playing a football game and scoring 70 points on the other team and them scoring none and going, wait, how did we just lose? <laughs> Paul says something similar. He says, I'm sitting in prison. The powers have put me in prison, and yet my preaching is still building the church. It's, it's still expanding because we beat the powers through the power of God by laying down our life, Amen. by dying to self by coming together and reconciling as image bearers, following the way of Christ and the way of the cross. It's not through the wisdom of the world, it's through the power of God as his newly formed people who come through the water and are now, and think about that as my final statement, we, right here in this room, are God's message to the powers and principalities of the world. Look how wise I am. This is my wisdom. Mm -hmm. This is my victory over the division of the world, the powers. You guys are that important. Your unity is that important. Mm -hmm. You don't so much have a message as you are the message. Go carry it to the world. All right? Let's go.